Hello and welcome to the Waterloo Association's YouTube channel. My name is Owen Davis and I'm the Membership Secretary at the Association. And it's my great pleasure to be able to host today two of our experts as we discuss the release of the new trailer for Napoleon. With me today will be Paul Brunyi, who's the editor of the Waterloo Journal, and he has a particular interest in the St Helena period in Napoleon's life, as well as the British press and civil unrest in the UK during the Napoleonic period. And we will be joined by John Morwood, who has been the secretary for the Waterloo Association since 2013. He lectures widely on a range of Napoleonic themes and has co-authored a book on Nelson's flagship at the Battle of the Nile, and has also researched the life of Sir William Ponsonby, who died during the Battle of Waterloo. John has also lectured uh, on a tour of Napoleon's Italian battlefields, and he has visited many of the Napoleonic sites, including Austerlitz. So, welcome again to the channel, and I hope you all enjoy the programme. I, I, was, I was thinking today, uh, when I was musing on this, about the coronation of Napoleon and Josephine. And there was great debate about whether um, David's painting should show Napoleon uh, crowning Josephine, or whether it should show Napoleon crowning himself. Um, and while I was looking at that, I, I, I noticed a, a note somewhere that of course, uh, one of the people who gets a tremendous um, outline with a dark background behind her in the painting in uh, Notre Dame is, is Madame Mer, Napoleon's mother. Which is all very well, but she wasn't there. Oh. You know, oh. yeah. Uh, history is, is painted by those who, who play the artist as, as uh, as they say, so that that's always a problem, isn't it? <laughs> I didn't know that. Oh, that's a, that must have been a, a bit for for poor Napoleon that his mum hadn't wasn't there to be at his coronation. Well, um, of course, she didn't necessarily approve of Josephine, <laughs> um, and and uh, again, um, Andrew Roberts. Uh, I read recently in the, that, that great book of his um, points out that. Um, only after Napoleon and Josephine are married um, does she reveal the um, the depth and width of, of her financial worries. And of course, he's a great man, as, as Napoleon, for um, trying to uh, keep um, his ledgers in order, whether it be the number of muskets going to the army or the amount of money in his personal funds. So to discover that uh, Josephine is um, a profligate uh, woman uh, did not go down very well with him. But how wise of her to wait till we were married to reveal it. And, and, and that's, not, that's not to be rude uh, <laughs> uh, about Josephine. Um, because I, I, I think um, you, you've, got to, you've got to remember that during, during the horrors of, of the revolution that um, she, first of all, was born in the West Indies. She, it's her grandfather who'd taken the family out there to set up um, a plantation. And of course, she gets to um, her teenage years and, and she's sent to France to, to set up a good marriage. And... Um, she marries uh, General uh, Boanet. Uh, they have the two chul children, and she's at the uh, you know wrong place, wrong time. And he Boanet is uh, dragged before uh, a court, and um, with very little ceremony, he is sent to the guillotine. And in the, the period between being arrested and being sent to the guillotine, uh, she actually stands up for him which is very brave of her because she's got two children to think about as well as a husband. But in revolutionary France, she actually stands up for him. Okay. And as a result of all that, after, after he's executed, um, she ends up in jail in Paris. Okay. 
And I, I do wonder to what extent the fact that she is in this church crypt in central Paris, along with a lot of other well-to-do people who must be looking at that door in a place that has apparently very little air circulating, is crowded, where the prisoners get, I think it's one bottle of supposedly fresh water a day for all their needs, and no lavatories, and at what passes for breakfast, lunch, and evening meal, they're looking at that door wondering who's going to be dragged out next. Mm. Um, she, she, put, she puts up with all that as, as well. So in, in part, I'm not surprised, as, as some historians, and generally men, uh, I'm not surprised that they said, well, she, she was a very avaricious woman. Um, but um, Andrew Roberts, again, has put it quite strongly. He says, yeah, in, in effect, is she suffering from PTSD? Lost her husband. She's got two young children to think about. Uh, she's uh, crossed the ocean. And uh, suddenly she's, she's got no, no man with money to look after her. Is it any wonder that she sees Napoleon and she thinks, and supposedly this is all happening after uh, Toulon and uh, the, uh, the events of uh, the 13th of Vendée it, is is this the man she sees? who's newly appointed as a general, general at 24, blimey. Um, that's gonna provide the stability. That, that, that she wants and not surprisingly as I half jokingly said a moments ago she um reveals all these debts she has um and this is a really interesting point Paul because this is something I wanted to, to draw out when we're talking about this a bit more because this is kind of this one of the central themes that's going to be in the central driving forces behind this new film and we see that in a couple of scenes uh in the new trailer for the Ridley Scott film Napoleon there are a couple of moments where it's very much focused on Josephine uh, and Napoleon's relationship. And the quote that Scott himself has said is that he views the um, Napoleon's career as he's, you know, he's a man that comes out of nowhere to rule everything. But all the while he was waging a romantic war with his adulterous wife, Josephine. Uh, he conquered the world to try to win her love. And when he couldn't, he conquered it to destroy her and destroyed himself in the process. Now, this is a really interesting thought and process behind what the director is thinking. I know, John, you were mentioning earlier, there was some, uh, maybe there's some issues with timing, uh, particularly uh, later on in the film. Yes, I think um, one of the things that I just want to explore a little bit more, because I think what Paul has said is absolutely fascinating about this relationship between Josephine and and Napoleon, uh, I mean, Napoleon has come out of nowhere. It's a stroke of luck that puts him in that position of too long. And uh, Josephine also, as Paul has said, has had this awful experience. I mean, it wasn't a happy marriage with Boane. Boane was the son of uh, a French noble that... Uh, Josephine's aunt had a fling with. So that's sort of how they actually met. He was a lot older than her. They had two children, but that uh, he basically abandoned Josephine, and this is before the revolution, to go and live with his mistress. So it must have been a really unhappy marriage. And yet, as Paul says, this is a woman who stands up for him. So she's certainly got guts and she's got charisma. And there is a story, and it, it is in Andrew's book on them, you know, when uh, Napoleon has found out that uh, Josephine has been unfaithful, at one stage he's determined, he's, he's told Marmont, I'm going to end it all, etc., etc., I'm going to storm back to Paris, um, I'm going to storm in that house and actually fling her out. And by the time Marmont gets to Paris, he finds that Napoleon is in bed with Josephine and everything is okay. So she's certainly um, a force to be reckoned with. And I think in a way it's a coming together of two people that both seize their opportunities. You know, Napoleon, best will in the world, 1769, born, um, born in Corsica. It's just become France, so it's only been French for a year. 
Um, he's um, that gives him the one opportunity to get on the, the, the ladder of the of the army in the in the Onshan regime. But of course, he hasn't got big backers. He can't really progress much further. And by the time you get to this situation, in August 1793, there he is manning a convoy supply to get um, basically ammunition and troops into um, the area around Toulon for the French to start besieging it. And the reason he gets the job is twofold. There's, and there is a bit of luck in this guy. One, the guy who's commanding the artillery is wounded in the sortie. But second, Napoleon has written a political tract. He's a wise guy. He's written this thing that's very pro Jacobin, called the Super at Beaucaire. And um, Napoleon actually connects with the, he recognises the uh, the French representatives on mission, how powerful those men are from the Committee of Public Safety. And he goes and tells Salisetti, you know, um, I can do great things. And there was a person who, said, who had a better track record in artillery for actually commanding the besieging of Toulon. He doesn't get the job because he's seen by Salisetti as not being pro-Jacobin enough. Mm. Napoleon is. And, uh, you know, there's, there's there's no doubt he does link in, interestingly, very much as Paul says, you know, some people have criticised these initial artillery dispositions are too long. Um, but we're seeing a young guy in his 20s here working his way up, taking his chances. You can't doubt his bravery uh, when he goes in with Dugomier to try and storm that fort, the key fort at Toulon, Fort Mulgrave. And he, he, he sees the opportunities and he takes them. And in a way, Josephine does the same. And I wonder if, really speaking, we're looking here at two, you know, one of the great power couples. Uh, they complement each other. Yes, of course, we fall out over her infidelity, over debts, et cetera, et cetera. But she chooses him, he chooses her, and it's an ideal match. And one of the things that I do worry about when we're talking about before is because she dies in May 1814. And what I don't want to, to see in this film is Napoleon doing one of his Homeric things of grief for Josephine. Let me all throw it away in 1815. I, I'm hoping that that doesn't appear in the film. <laughs> Well, I suppose that's a, that's a really good point, John. And we've also, I think, um, as you say, that they are both taking their opportunities. I was um, looking looking again at um, Napoleon's rise to, to power. And, 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 you, you, and as much as there were dangers for everyone uh, throughout France uh, due to the terror, um, for a lot of young intelligent officers, it is a time for uh, taking opportunities. I noticed that if if you if you're to list the the, the time spent in each um, grade of of commissioned service, Napoleon spends five and a half years as a second lieutenant, a year as a lieutenant, sixteen months as a captain, three months as a major, and by the age of 24, he's a brigadier general. And definitely, you've just got to think, what a meteoric rise. As, as you say, John, he's taking his um, his opportunities. And, and with um, it's interesting to look at his early life. And, and again, uh, two or three books that, uh, that I generally refer to. You see him as a, a young man with promise on Corsica. Corsica is always um, a poor island. And on that poor island, the Bonapartes, of course, are at the top of the social hierarchy. Carlo Bonaparte um, is a, a lawyer. Uh, I think it's his, his uncle who is this, the Bishop of Ayakio. And so the, the family are involved in, to a small extent in the law, in the church and in farming. Uh, but they are, uh, and the piece of luck starts with father, Carlo, because it is he that when there is an insurrection on Cor Corsica, the prospect of, of France taking over Corsica, uh, as they are effectively sold by Genoa, um, Carlo in the end uh, surrenders to uh, the authority of the French state. 
and he does sign um, an oath of loyalty to Louis XV. And that means that for one of the prominent families on the island, he retains his uh, gentlemanly status, which then obviously gives Napoleon the entry to the military academy. And, and it's, it's probably at that point, unbeknownst to Napoleon or the rest of the family, that um, this meteoric rise is, is going to take place. Um, and, and as you're saying about, about them taking their, their chances, um, both, both Josephine and Napoleon are strangers in France. He's come from Corsica. She's come from the West Indies, and of course they are they are both um, hopping from safety spot to safety spot as as they go through uh, the terror. And uh, one of Napoleon's um, great maxims and, and, and adages, of course, when appointing someone to the rank of a general officer, is he may be competent in this, he can do that. <laughs> But is he lucky? And I, I think during the early 90s, there is that, that, that there is that early period when, um, in a sense, he's both lucky and unlucky in, in, in that when uh, Robespierre and the rest of the directory finally fall and the, uh, the terror is brought to an end, um, it's just ill luck for Napoleon that he's um, actually um, in the south of France. And I think he goes to, I think he's in Genoa, where he's carrying out a survey of, of defences and also carrying, and this is a, a secret meeting uh, that uh, Maximilian's brother, the other Robespierre, arranges with Napoleon. And um, when, uh, the Robespierre's, etc., all the co-conspirators of the terror are rounded up and promptly executed. Um, obviously, the, the new government uh, decides to investigate uh, who are the other uh, outer members of the great uh, circle of terrorist revolutionaries. And in August of that year, they do actually finally catch up with Napoleon. And that's the time, and you sometimes see this amongst images of Napoleon, where um, you suddenly see an image of, of him as a young artillery officer looking very poor uh, and starved in his garret. And the other one you sometimes see when he's in prison for 10 days. But fortunately, and yet again, this is when his luck, luck um, kicks in, um, there's no evidence against him because he has shown that he is a, a loyal uh, servant of the ideals of the revolution, not necessarily of the governments, but certainly of the... Um, of the ideals of, of the revolution, um, and I mean, because we were we were kind of alluding to that a bit earlier, but you were saying about <clears throat> potentially, um, as Andrew Roberts has been arguing, potentially Josephine had PTSD, and we were saying earlier that there was a few instances where it did come a bit close to to ending. So would we say that their relationship is as turbulent as I suspect that Ridley Scott is going to, to portray, just from what we can see so far in the trailers? I, 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 I think that's that's very fair because it comes across in, in several of, of the biographers of, of Napoleon um, that he is in some ways a, a, a very naive young man in terms of his understanding of uh human emotions and frailties and and one of the things that struck me over the last couple of days reading about this and musing on it is that um there is there is that old adage that the um the opposite of love isn't hate it's indifference and napoleon is never indifferent towards um Jose josephine and and yes he did he did see women as having a uh, a function in society, but not on a level with men. Uh, and, and, and I think part of that is his lack of experience of actually just socialising uh, with women of uh, his equal in, in terms of their positions in, in the social hierarchy. I mean, he is poor 
at small talk. He's, he's never interested in small talk. He's just so busy, as, as we know. As you were saying, John, the success he, he experiences at, at too long is, is both due to his uh, abilities as an artillery officer and his capacity for, for hard work. Mm. But but he's no no, it's absolutely useless. Uh, what we would think of as, as the, the social ni niceties. I think that is very very true. I mean, one of the things that struck me is at Toulon, he it's not just Salisetti, but it's one of the representatives on mission. Baraz is as well, and of course Josephine will be Baraz's mistress, and yes. uh, Baraz will, in a way, pass her over to Napoleon. And in a way, I'll be, I'll be really interested in this film, in the role of Baraz. I mean, we've always looked on Talleyrand as being one of the great survivors, but Baraz, I would put into the same category, and I'm just going to be really interested to see how they play Baraz, because I think, you've, you know, you've got this guy who rises from being one of the representatives on mission, agent of the Committee of Public Safety, but there he is after that's all fallen mm. as one of the directors and calling the shots. It'll be really interesting to see how Ridley Scott play, uh, has the actor played that role. Because mm. like I say, he's it, I, I, really unusually, I thought he was like said, he's given more screen time than some of Napoleon's generals in, in that trailer. I mean, Barrow appears twice with an actual speaking role. So, like I said, maybe that's a hopeful sign that he's going to have a bit more of a role than just this is formerly, you know, but Josephine's first um, lover, and now we're going to move on to Napoleon, and that's going to be the main story. Because that then nicely brings us on to some of the thoughts about that early rise to Napoleon. And quick question, because the last time I read about Toulon was a very, very long time ago. But from what I read, I don't remember... Napoleon actually hitting any ships in the harbour when they capture it, but maybe I'm wrong, <laughs> and I'm willing to. I'm willing to. But does anybody? <laughs> yeah, I, 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 th I think what what he's worked out um, with his planning is is that Fort Fort Mulgrave that, that John's already alluded to. That that's the position of, of vital importance. Um, because it overlooks both the inner and I think the outer harbour. And, and he'd, he'd already worked out that if, if they can take Fort Mulgrave, um, that allows him to get access to the gun embrasures and the guns and to um, actually start firing on, on the Royal Navy. And I, th I, th I think what happens is that... Uh, a couple of the smaller vessels, possibly powder hoys, are, are blown up in, in one of the, the harbours. And I think that's what may, may, may have happened. Let me help here on this one. Um, one of the things Napoleon um, is determined to do when he gets this, this role of being, in a way, um, leader of the artillery, is he's always worried that someone else is going to come and take over. And so what he wants to do is impress people. And the, what I think is really key about Toulon is the three French army commanders in charge at Toulon, one after the other. And by the time you get to the um, Barras and Salisetti coming down with full orders from the Committee of Public Safety, the first two of them did squat when capable of doing so. What they want is somebody that can actually take this battle, take this town. And Napoleon basically says, I'll do it. I can do it. And what he does seem to do is he spends a lot of time actually showing off to the um, or both the uh, representatives that he can actually do this. And he, in 48 hours, he's pulled together a battery. He's actually gone and uh, motivated a group of disenchanted artillerymen who've been sat on the backside of the Middle squad. He's pulled in naval guns from other positions on the coast, and then he opens fire, just to show the committee, that, uh, the representatives, that he's actually doing something, and they should confirm him permanently in role. Imagine everybody's surprised when he hits a captured French frigate, which is now flying the British flag. So there's a frigate 
hit. Now, he's not got that much ammunition, so he fires three shots, and Napoleon's luck, one hits the frigate. Well, what he then does is, over a period of time, he actually constructs probably more 15 batteries, and the, and the representatives on mission say, yeah, keep on going, because as far as they're concerned, he's the only person that's doing anything to take too long. And the more batteries you uh, he actually constructs, the more artillery pieces he brings in, he can hit ships in the inner harbour. And Paul's absolutely right. The British uh, Hood tries to put in two barges to attack Napoleon's positions, his batteries, and Napoleon's ships destroy them. But they also bizarrely set on fire, although the fire is put out very, very quickly, a Spanish warship, because remember, Toulon isn't just British, there's more Spanish um, troops at Toulon than an ally at the time, and San Juan de Pachimo, which is going to be a Trafalgar, is actually set on fire, would you believe, by one of Napoleon's guns. So you've got this guy who's just seized the initiative, he's lucky, he can show tantalisingly to people this can work. And when you do get that meeting, when the French bring in the third commander, Dugobier, who actually is the only one who's had proper military experience, and they have the Council of War, everybody agrees that um, they should go for Fort Mulgrave. And it's going to be a pincer movement. There's an attack put on the eastern part of the harbour to, to make the Allies think that that's where the attack will come. There's an attack. De Gommier puts an attack on the, the western part of the harbour, led by Victor, later on, of course. And that attack stalls. And De Gommier then makes a decision, we think, of asking for the reserve to go in. Who's committing? Who's in charge of the reserve? Napoleon's got his hands on the reserve, and Napoleon does, and it is shown in the film. Oh, cool. yes, Napoleon yeah. is, is up there getting in through the good embrasures on Fort Mulgrave, and that's actually what happens. And as Paul says, once you take uh, Fort Mulgrave and the other attacks, they may not have been that successful on the eastern part of the harbour, but by then we've got shaky people from Sardinia, and Naples, who are also fighting alongside the Spanish and the, and the, and the British troops, they are shaky and they flee. And all of a sudden, the Allied thing starts to collapse. So I, I do feel that the, that, that the credit given to Napoleon for too long is justified. I really do. So I'm looking forward to seeing how they do that in the film, because uh, 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 as we, we've always said, you know, is it more of a Napoleonic hype? Well, actually, it might not have been in this case. Say, I, I, I say, and is, is, is Fort Morgrave the one where he gets stabbed in the thigh? Yes, it is. And it's actually the one where he comes closest to death. Because, you know, all this stuff about, you know, being wounded in the heel or wherever it is, that that is born in, in, in the 1809 campaign. No, if he, the bone was going to be seen off, it's a Fort Mulgrave, definitely, 1793. I hadn't realised quite how many, and, and, and like I say, just shows his grasp of topography as just as much as you know and that arteryman's eye that's mm. famously about that he could hit um so many vessels inside the harbour it's really, really interesting well i don't okay. think in all fairness i don't think it's going to be as many as is shown in the epic where you seem to see the whole of the fleet being bombarded but the point is, he's done it previously. And it's in a way, it's a mentality issue. He was able to hit a few of our ships. We pulled out of the inner harbour. Now they've got Fort Mulgrave and they're taking other of the positions. What are they going to do now? So, in a way, as in so many of Napoleon's campaigns, he's won the mental campaign. Which yes, he has. He, he, yeah, he's established a moral superiority um, uh, over the enemy. Which, and this, this then, um, I want to think about this, this, this little bit of potential myth making that's been here for a while. 
so we so we move on from Toulon, we move on from that the revolutionary upheavals in the beginning and that relationship with Josephine starts to form. And then Napoleon goes on to what apart from Russia, arguably is one of his most famous campaigns, is Egypt. Um and we see them using the pyramids as target practice. And I, I think that this is a bit of a nod to an older tradition, which is that he used he told his grenadiers to use the nose of the Sphinx as target practice. But is there any particular reason why we're we've got this obsession that Napoleon, despite the fact that he brought so many Egyptologists with him, so many men of science with him in order to study Egypt, why there's this feeling that he actually went out there and took pot shots at some of its greatest memorials? No, I, I, I think, um, to put it simply, it, it looks good, doesn't it? I mean, how do you know it's Egypt? It's got sand. Well, it, 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 it could be Bridlington on the East Yorkshire coast, but if it's got the pyramids, it's Egypt. Um, and yeah, it, 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 in terms of the historiography, I, you do hope that in the movie that um, emphasis is, is 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 given to the scientific work that was undertaken in Egypt because it was um, very impressive um, when you think of, of um, all the sketches that were made, the excavations that were car carried out, the, the measuring that went on to take back to France um, lots of artefacts, but also a lot of data uh, about, about ancient Egypt. Um, yeah, I, I do hope that that gets covered. Um, and then, yeah, so, and, and, then, and then you get some, I mean, one, one of the things about the stories about Napoleon is is that um, you do have to be aware that um, some of the biographers that, that appear after Waterloo uh, do feature former generals and uh, and diplomats who are very keen to um, maintain their positions in the French military or in uh, French diplomatic service. So the, I, I think. Um, the notion that there is a long line of the black legend where uh, Napoleon is, is maligned in order people uh, are, to, are to keep their pensions under, under government uh, does, does start shortly after, after Waterloo, which does include the rather brutal, um, supposedly, uh, massacre of, of the, the prisoners at al in, in Egypt and, and also supposed poisoning of um, the the French who were sick with with the plague in Egypt, but um, both of these it's, it, it, it seems when I, I I look at some of the, um, the translated French accounts that I've looked at that these are much exaggerated, and you have the, the unfortunately harsh but um, generally accepted um, concept to do with the prisoners. Um, of al -Arish. these were these were men who had given their parole and and then were were released and told effectively um you have to go back home and we we will uh for, for a lot of them they were disarmed i think particularly the marmalukes were disarmed uh and then were, were told to leave the campaign area uh and what napoleon discovers is is that you get uh in a in the subsequent battle um, you actually get them taking arms again. And it's at that point that he realised he's, he's advanced further into, uh, the, uh, into the interior and he has neither water uh, nor bread to, to feed uh, and succour them. Uh, and only really enough for, for the French army. Uh, and, and that's when they are um, shot for taking up arms the second time, having, having given their parole, which is very harsh. But again, we, we, get, we can look at Badajoz in, in, in the peninsula and, and see the, the awful things that were done after Badajoz was breached by, by the British army. So this, this is the reality of, of, of warfare in, um, at the end of the 18th and the beginning of the 19th century.
Um, John, you look, you look as though you wanted to say something. No, I think that's absolutely fine. I totally agree with everything you've said, Paul. Uh, I, I was because I was always just wondering. I was always curious whether it was, like you say, whether it was other generals spreading the the myth about Napoleon, or whether it was a piece of British spin uh, that uh, it's, it's been often so famously uh, pointed out in Gilray uh, and his works about Napoleon. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah there the, 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 the was, and 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 there there is. Um, I've, I've forgotten the name now, but but there was there's one. Is it Wilson? Is it Wilson's history of the campaign that talks about this, um, about Napoleon's insistence that the um, his medical staff poison some of the French sick at Jaffa, yeah. uh, and about the cruelty of uh, Napoleon dealing with prisoners at El Arish. Um But certainly with the sick at Jaffa, uh, it, it seems to be the case that the that just about everybody is dead before the French leave. Um, and it's Napoleon who suggests that perhaps uh, mortal amounts of more uh, cocaine, I think, uh, be administered to uh, the, the mortally ill uh, survivors. And I think there's something something like four or five left um, before the last of the French troops leave, leave there. Um, and, and the notion of men giving their parole and then fighting, fighting on, uh, was simply received short shrift across across Europe. Yeah, really, really likes it. Really interesting to to, to look at behind some of these, some of the stories. Because I say so many, so much of this often comes down to us from recollections and memories of different soldiers who were either there. Or rumors and stories. I mean, even even in the age of mm. media attention, so much of this goes to comes from um, what was the famous French expression to lie like a bulletin, wasn't it? Yes. Uh, if I, I I might not be saying that one hundred percent for the quote, um, which interesting enough because we we do see a bit later on. Then there is a scene which must be Austerlitz because there's a scene a bit later on where um, Napoleon is informed by a general that they've been discovered, they uncover their cannon, and they fire on several soldiers on a lake. Now, obviously, we don't know. Maybe this could be 1812, um, but there's a, probably a good chance it's Auslitz. Now, what do we think about um, kind of that story of the Prats in uh, lakes or ponds, as some people have described them as? Well, if we assume it's Auslitz, we assume it's Auslitz, of course, to lie like a bulletin, you can actually put what you want in the bulletin. And what the the, the origin of this story is um, 20,000 um, Austrian, mainly Russian troops, killed by crossing frozen ponds, French artillery opened fire, and 20,000 are, are killed. And this is actually fueled by Napoleon very shortly after the battle. Um, Assuming it's Austerlitz, we've got some problems with this as a story. Uh, and I do hope that, you know, in the film, we'll see the true mastery of Napoleon at Austerlitz, the deception of the Russian high command in thinking that Napoleon doesn't want to give her battle, the actual masterstroke pulling off Gatson and then obviously retaking it, putting the Allied army in half, et cetera, et cetera. The battle is won before what actually happens at the ponds. And this is where the Russian left, realising that um, it's being attacked now on two fronts, the, the French right, which is held on, and obviously the troops being sent down from the uh, French position, having retaken, the Prats and decide to retreat. There are true two ponds. Ponds. It, the ponds have got ice on them, and the weather of December 1805 for, for about three or four days has been mild. Some of the ice isn't as thick as it was. Absolutely true, absolutely true. There are some artillery positioned by the French to basically cut off the Russian um, retreat along a road which skirts the pond, and also to fire on a 
uh, the accounts differ, a bridge or a causeway that separates the two ponds. So we know that some artillery is used here. Um, what's the problems with the story? Well, it isn't 20,000 men killed because there's only 5,000 Russian troops in the vicinity at the time of the retreat. Secondly, the ponds aren't deep. One is actually used to, to provide the Austrians with carp. And it's reckoned that people could actually wade through the ponds. The story about the carp is really important because about two weeks after the battle, the French basically drain the pond to actually get their hands on the fish to feed the army, the troops that are still there. What do they find? Do they find 20,000 Russian dead? Or as David Chandler said, perhaps 2,000. No, they find three Russian dead and a hundred horses and cannon. And I'm left thinking that what actually happens here is that there will be some people drowned crossing the ponds. We know that. But most people will stagger their way through, will stay on the, the actual um, shoreline, just like at Lake Pipes, it's a great, you know, other battle on the ice, the Russians fighting the Teutonic Order. Um, but artillery is too heavy. And I think what actually happens is if there are casualties at the ponds, then, um, you know, it's going to be the horses dragging Russian artillery who in the panic as darkness is falling. You know, this is happening between two and four o'clock in December. I think it's going to be the artillery trains that take the hit, literally, when they cross the ice. I think it's a wonderful piece of propaganda by Napoleon because he, he's basically showing to everybody this is his great victory. He's deceived the enemy in giving the battle in the first place. He's done the master stroke. And here, here is him turning around and saying, and I delivered the coup de grace as well. So I think it's a wonderful piece of hype. It happened to some extent, but not as great as Napoleon evidently wanted people to believe. I don't know what, what, what you think, Paul. I think you've said that very, very well, John. Yes. Um, and as, as you say, to, to lie like a bulletin, it's, uh, it, it, it's, it's just, just, just sums it up, doesn't it? Yeah, it was brilliant planning on, on his part, having the bottle to wait, uh, to withdraw and to take it again. It, it, it's stunning. Um, but, it, but equally, um, the, there's, there's no point in saying we won 3 1 when you could say we won 6 1. Um, yeah, uh, in, in terms of just showing, uh, imbuing the enemy with, with, with a sense of failure and a sense of the innate severity of, of French arms as well, by, by, by declaring such. Yeah. Like you say, it is almost a callback to the great heroes of the past, like you say, uh, Alexander Nevsky, all the way back uh, uh, at Lake Kippus, uh, and saying, I'm, I am much like them, and mm. I'm as good as them, or maybe better, even. Uh, I'm not sure quite how Napoleon would have uh, viewed that. Maybe he would have said better. Um, so then what did, so what did we think about Waterloo in comparison? Because you get these some great shots of them coming into the to the squares um, in May's charge towards the end of the day. What, what were some thoughts about that um, as a representation? Yeah, I, th I, th I, th I thought that was quite good. But bearing, bearing in mind that to enthusiasts such as ourselves, we already have, um, we've got the Christopher Plummer and uh, Steiger movie. So in, in a sense, um, we're um, a little bit oversated, shall we say, uh, particularly with, with the, the Russian penchant for uh, clouds of billowing petroleum-based smoke. Um, uh, but yeah, it's good to see swirling cavalry uh, close up to those squares, which is something we, we don't particularly see, I, th I think, in, in the 1970 Waterloo movie. So, so that's good. Um, but I'm, I'm hoping that we... Uh, I was more taken, I have to say, with uh, that, that shot in Ridley Scott's movie of uh, uh, Joachim Phoenix galloping along very competently on his horse and swinging a sabre. Mm. 
um, which my understanding has always been that uh, Napoleon has um, even less less competence than me on a horse, and uh, I've, I've even fallen off a hobby horse uh, in my time. Yeah, so um, good, but um, which also leads me on to. Did Napoleon ever, sorry, did Wellington ever refer to Napoleon as vermin? I, I, I think he was um, far, far too much of a gentleman to do so. And, I, and you've only got to look at the, um, his correspondence in uh, Wellington's dispatches. He, I mean, when he's in Spain, he always refers to uh, Joseph either as the king or as Joseph. And um, he refers to Napoleon. In his correspondence as Napoleon, um, and uh, that did seem a little harsh to me. Uh, to referring to him. that, um, um, the the actor um, Rupert Everett playing Wellington uh, in that clip says, uh, "He's no gentleman." Is is, is something that's oft, often um, uh, used in one way or another, in one form or another, uh, about some French officers. But um, yes, that, that seemed very harsh to, to, my, to my way of thinking. I'm intrigued on this one because they've made a, a statement, haven't they, that, you know, the six battles are going to be featured here, you know, depending on, on the calculation, Napoleon fights 61. But... What are the six battles going to be that are mm. going to be featured in this film? Now, obviously, we know too long. We're guessing it's Auschwitz. Don't see why not. There's going to be Waterloo. There's three. What are the other ones? Uh, is it going? To, are they going to do Marengo? Are they? I mean, look, I suppose they're going to have to do Bolladino. But 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 which are the other ones that they are going to do? Gosh. And I think one of the real problems about this is, you know. As Paul says, we've been sated on the wonderful film Waterloo, Steiger and Plummer. We can't expect, given the running time of the film, for Waterloo to be treated in such depth as Steiger and Plummer did in in in, in that in that uh, in that film. So I, my worry about all of this is, you know, we'll go. Uh, the good news is, you know, it's two thousand and three since Master and Commander. We need something. For our favourite epic, you know, best in the world, Sean Bean's far too well for them to resurrect Sharp yet again. <laughs> um, oh God! Uh, um, so here we are. We, we've got we've got a film that's going to try and do Napoleon's rise and presumably fall with with, with Waterloo. It, it's going to give us a soup song, a taste for various things. But what we mustn't do is think that we're going to get in depth historical analysis of every single one of the battles. So. It, it comes back to what we were saying at the beginning. What's left in and what's left out? And that's going to be fascinating because whereas we can argue with Wellington, Wellington is a great general, yes, but Napoleon is a great general and a great statesman, and that's a very different kettle of fish. And well, the one worry I have is that if uh, Ridley Scott's got to concentrate on Napoleon as a general through six battles and a relationship with Josephine, we won't see everything else that Napoleon brings to Europe. And that will be a pity. Yes. And, and, and talking of Wellington, I think whilst Wellington yes, is, is, is so important for the Waterloo that part of the campaign, it actually, on a, it, like you say, with time constraints, it would be more interesting on a personal note to see his relationship with Alexander of Russia because that, like you said, that's a person who he had more of an intimate relationship with for a much longer time than he ever did with Wellington, really. Because, as well, he is. If if history tells us, he only saw us from across a, uh, a battlefield. But some of the re latest releases of photos seem to show him uh, in in a in a captain's cabin uh, on a ship having a chat. My goodness, no, that I, I can't. I... Do you know, smelling salts for John straight away. Um, yes. So, so we we have to remember that, that that when he leaves Paris, at the insistence of the provisional government, Napoleon goes to Malmaison, uh, and and so that's that's deliberate by by the French government to get him out of the way, so he can't raise uh, the mob who he'd faced down and shredded. Uh, on the 13th of Vendée-Marie. Um, 
and and then agonizingly he takes the decision that he knows he has to leave and goes to Rochefort where he ends up um prevaricating on on when and where he should uh, depart from from France uh, the naval uh, telegraph shutter system sends signals saying the government advises um, his, his majesty to, to leave France now the sooner he does it the better for the nation as a whole um, and then Admiral Hotham um, has command of the Royal Naval Squadron down the uh, western edge of France, which covers Rochefort. He detaches uh, HMS Bellerophon under Captain Maitland, and it's to uh, Bellerophon and Captain Maitland that Napoleon uh, presents himself. And presumably that, that's the still that you're referring to of uh, uh, Joachim Phoenix on, on board, we think, HMS Victory, uh, representing that there. Um, so that's still showing Wellington in uh, a cabin of um, victory. Never happens, and it is the deliberate policy of the government that Napoleon A is not to be landed in England and he is not to meet uh, anyone of note. And that particularly includes uh, the Prince Regent. Uh, and it's um, Admiral Keith, I think, in one of his letters who writes, were he to meet the prince, then they would become the best of friends in five minutes. Um, <laughs> and so not even not even Maitland's wife is allowed to come on board of Bellerophon uh, when they're, they're anchored off uh, Torbay uh, near, near Brixham. And then they, they move around towards Plymouth uh, when there's an attempt by... Um, Whig admirers of uh, Napoleon to try and get uh, Napoleon landed to take take part as a witness in um, a court case. So it's all a bit of a put up job, but the bottom line is Napoleon never meets Wellington face to face um, at all. And the nearest connection we get other than across Waterloo is that Wellington on returning from India had stopped at St. Helena Island. Um, and that's the nearest connection they, they ever get. A little, bit of, a little bit of foreshadowing there, really, in the story. Yes, yeah. So I, I think, um, uh, as, as, as you were saying sometime earlier, I mean, I think it's, it's possibly a dream sequence, or, or, or as John would would probably say, a bit of a nightmare, actually, a bit of a nightmare, the idea of Napoleon and Wellington facing each other across a small table. Um, yeah. So there we are. Well, I think what will also be great about this film, um, which is what besides the whether it's a dream sequence but actually plays out, is, is like all these things, spotting where the locations actually are, because I think they're using one of the forts on Malta for Port Mulgrave and too long. But the rest of a lot of the locations are in England. So Lincoln Cathedral is doubling up for Notre Dame. And Blenheim Palace will be, is being used. West Wickham Park is being used. So is um, Petworth. So it's going to be one of those great ones of trying, uh, trying to spot the locations. Mm. Um, uh, uh, so, of course, is the Royal Navy... Uh, uh, Greenwich. So, uh, you, you know, it'll be great to see uh, if we can spot the various locations that have been used. Oh, I can hear they're using Greenwich as well. That's really cool. So, like I say, and this is, I think that's, this is going to be the really exciting thing. It's, it's, it is so nice, like you were mentioning earlier, John, we are, we are seeing for the first time a major blockbuster on the Napoleonic period. And like I say, there are, there'll be things here and there that we can chat about, and I'm sure we'll chat about this in the future, but I think the more people are interested uh, in the podium, the more people in effectively a world changing event in, in history, the better. Um, so I have one last question for you both. Um, out of all the things, and obviously we appreciate that the trailer is just a trailer for now, things will change. So many trailers promise a lot of stuff and then things get cut for time, things like that. Uh, and also 
Um, we've got we've also got the time constraints on the film itself. What would be the one thing that you would like to see brought to life in the final production for the Napoleon film? I would like to see, sorry, Paul, I would like to see how they explain um, the decision to invade Russia in 1812. Mm. Because my understanding from a presentation by um, Andrew Bamford a number of years ago now is that the Napoleon does not intend to invade Russia. He aims to do a repeat of 1807, defeat an invading Russian army in Poland. And the Russian war cabinet is split, and there's a literally a one vote in it that says, no, we're not going to play that game. We will hold fire on um, actually staying for the English and letting him come in here. And I would love to see if that is actually covered. Or will we get the, the thing, you know, oh, he, he was just being crazy, he just wanted to do, you know, straight away he was going to go to Russia. So I'd love to see that. Mm. As I say, it's a, it's such a it's so fascinating that that it's like a slow, slow, almost crawling, to, uh, you know, almost sliding through treacle towards war. But it almost seems inevitable as eighteen ten passes into eighteen eleven that things are not looking good between France and Russia after, all, like you say, the 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 very positive relations that come out of Tilts uh, in eighteen oh seven. Um, so, Paul, what would you like to see? What's the one thing you'd like to see for our uh, uh, I, 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 I'm very much looking forward to seeing um, Joachim Felix's portrayal of the man and that ability of Napoleon to um, turn his attention from one subject to another to become uh, emotionally involved with his soldiers at a one-to-one -one level and to suddenly then turn to matters of, of state, dealing with perhaps um, plans for the building of new dock, dockyards in, in, in the west of France, and then to turn. Uh, and I, I, I'll go back to that, um, that single image of, of, Nepal, of um, Joachim Phoenix in character on that chair, and the way, way the cinematographer has lit his face, so that ear, sorry, that ear, that eye pierces uh, the centre of the image. And I think, gosh, if that's an indicator of what he, the actor, is able to do, um, then um, I, I look forward to seeing this, uh, the calibre of, of the man revealed in, in, in the acting. I, I, I can remember many years ago uh, uh, being... Uh, present when uh, a British general, I'd say who it is, walked into this um, this this room, and the reaction of a couple of hundred soldiers around him was remarkable. He had real charisma, and as he walked through uh, this huge shed, you could see people just standing up, straining to look at him. And I thought, yeah, there's there's. There's, there's an edge of that magic that I, I believe uh, Napoleon possessed. Uh, and whether it was in front of his um, soldiers, uh, rollicking some battalion commander for, for not getting the, uh, the bread and wine of um, in, in time for his soldiers and, and sharing that knowledge with his soldiers as he rocked a senior regimental commander in front of them and thus um, increasing yet again their devotion to him, or whether it was dealing with civil servants who were desperately trying their best and yet still unable to keep up with him in understanding a technical problem about the building of roads. Yeah, it's it's his interpretation of the man that I'm really looking forward to seeing. Fantastic. Oh, as one other thing, one tiny thing that John was going to mention, which is that, um, first of all, uh, Josephine is uh, six years older than Napoleon. So when we, I think we just see barely a second of them stepping out of the church in, you know, I think 1794 when they marry, um, she's, she's six years older than him. And so he does gallantly agree on um, 
the civil wedding certificates to knock a couple of years off his age. And I think she she um, advances her date of birth by at least four years, uh, which is a joke which apparently on more than one occasion absolutely tickles him to death. And he says, do you, you realise that um, Hortense, your daughter, must have been, been born when she was 12? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> how, how would you say you are on marriage certificate? Which I just think was 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 lovely. Um, but yeah, he, he 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 does he did have a sense of humour as, as well. Uh, uh, well, I hope they include that in there. I think that would make a great entry as well. Um, well, thank you, gentlemen. Thank you so much. Absolutely fantastic to chat to you both about this. And I think you know. And when we will come back. Uh, a bit later on in November, December time, when the film is out, we'll have a bit of a chat then and see if some of the things that we were hoping for managed to make it into the final edit. So thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. Uh, I hope we'll see you next time. Absolute pleasure, Owen. Thank you so much for doing this. Owen, bless you. It's been grand. Thank you.